Lane Gray here, Plastering for Beginners, and today I'm going to show you how to render the wall. So I'm going to show you the full process, I'm going to go through each step, bit by bit, and show you the full process and how to start rendering. Before we start, what I'm going to do is give you a brief rundown on exactly what's involved. So there's five steps. you got step number one, which is applying a render. We call the first coat the scratch coat. And just to let you know, there's always two coats of render in a traditional sand cement render fixing. So you've got the first coat, which is a scratch coat. You apply it, and then you scratch it. We'll go into this in pure detail, but the reason you scratch it is so when you apply the second coat, it's got something to grip to. If you don't, it'll just fall off. So the first stage is applying the second coat, and then you rule it, which is where basically you get um, it's a long metal bar, which is flat, and what you do is you rule the render flat. So you never apply your render and make it flat with your trowel. You always rule it so it's completely flat all the way across horizontally and vertically. So we're going to go into that. Then the fourth stage is floating. It's basically where we continue to flatten the wall. And that's when you also start to smooth it at the same time. And the fifth stage is sponging. So there's your five stages to rendering a wall. That's a brief introduction on what we're going to go into this video. And what I'm going to do is walk you through each stage bit by bit. We're also going to talk about the mixing rendering. And uh, I'm going to give you an opportunity to explore that further. So what I'm going to do is just jump straight into the video. I'm not going to waste any of your time. Um, let's get straight into it. The first stage is applying the scratch coat. Okay, let's quickly talk about the mix. Basically, there's three main ingredients to render. You've got sand, you've got cement, and in the top coat, which we'll talk about in a bit, you've got hydrated lime. These are the three main ingredients that you make and put together to make that sand cement render we're using in this video. So the first mix, which is a scratch coat, is always four sand, one cement, and some waterproofers. And this makes sure that any water that can penetrate the top coat is not gonna come through into our building. So that is, the in this edition, the additive is a waterproofer. The two main ingredients for the scratch coat is sand and cement. So you've got four sand to one, sand, uh, one cement. It's that simple. And what you usually do is mix it with like this, or you can use a big cement mixer. So that's the mix. And by the way, at the end of this video, I'll um, provide a link where we'll go into the mix for render in pure detail. So stay tuned for that. I'll give you an opportunity to have that. It's just a totally different subject in itself. But anyway, so what I'm doing, I've mixed it up. I can see the consistency. You don't want it too thick. You don't want it too runny. It's got to have a bit of body to it when you're applying render. It's got to have a bit of... Um, a bit of thickness because what we are doing this is going to be an overall thickness of 15 mil so you need it to be able to hold its weight so you do not want the mix too runny as you can see what we're doing is applying the render in little sections so i always fill my hawk up which is the handboard i'm using and the trowel is in my right hand but what you really want to be doing is just working in little sections at a time like i said it's going to eat a lot of your render up but what we're doing is we're pushing a lot of pressure behind the trowel to push the render into the block work. And then from there, you want to give it a quick flatten, but you don't want to over trowel the render. What will happen if you keep troweling the render, you'll pull the moisture from the back of the render and you'll bring it to the front, which basically means the render will have no grip to the brickwork. What I've done before this as well is I've sprayed the wall down with a bit of water. And what that means is when you are applying the render, it's got something to work to. It's got a key to grip to. So you always want to be working with moisture on your background before you apply any render. You don't want to be rendering when the background is completely dry. So like I said, we're just applying the render in sections and we're giving it a quick flatten, but not too much. So first, that was the first stage. All we're doing is applying the render. There's not much pressure there. What I'm going to do is I'm going to show you a little tip. I always rule my scratch coat. So what I'm gonna do is give you an introduction that's how to, we're gonna start getting the render flat. What I've actually used in this video though is an ox speed skim. So what I've done there is I've applied the render just before the bead. So what you want is you don't want the, bead, the render to be overflowing. You need it to be behind the point that you're gonna to finish to. You need to give room to apply your top coat. What I'm doing here is giving the wall a quick flatten. I am using Nox speed skim. Don't ever use this for the top coat by the way. But it's just nice to use for the scratch because it's nice and easy. But as you can see, this is how we start getting the wall flat. So this is called ruling. Like I said, I'm using a speed skin, but this is a quick rundown on how you would start getting your wall flat after application. What you do is use 
something that's straight and you rule it flat. You never use your trowel and this means it's going to stick to the wall and not fall off. The next thing, once you've ruled it, and so you don't have to rule your scratch coat, I just find it's good practice, especially, especially if you're starting out, because it's better to start getting used to the uh, ruling process straight away. But what we're doing is applying the scratch coat, applying the scratch to the render, sorry. This is basically a scourer, and what it does is it provides a mechanical key. And what that means is when you apply your second coat of render, it's got something to grip to. If you don't do this, the second coat will not stick and it'll all end up on the floor. So this is a mechanical key and we apply it ourselves to make sure the second coat sticks. Now you've got two options here. I'm gonna finish the top coat and I'm gonna do it on the same day. So I've applied a scratch and give it two hours just to let it dry up. And now I'm gonna put the top coat on straight away. Now usually, you put the scratch on, wait a day, and then top coat it the next day, if possible. Obviously weather dependent. But I'm gonna do it all on the same day because it's such a small area. I don't wanna be setting up and wasting time. So the process is the exact same though, regardless which way you do it. I've just put a gentle spray of water on this um, scratch now, but if it was coming day after, put a lot more water on just to let it soak up. So I'm gonna remix the render, just lubricate up a bit, and then carry on as we were. Let's do it. Okay, so let's quickly talk about the mix again. I'm about to apply my top coat. The top coat is slightly different. We add lime and more sand to the mix. So basically the mix changes for the top coat. It always needs to be weaker than the one before it. So the new mixture is five sand, one cement, and I'm adding lime to the mix now. This is the third ingredient in what I talked about before. Um, hydrated lime just allows for flexibility in the render. So if there is any movement, it's the, the top coat can move with the scratch and rather than cracking it just gives it more of a chance to um to restrain any movements in buildings not only that but if there is any cracks and what could happen the lime can actually repair itself so with the water the hydro the lime can actually fill in and um and kind of heal itself if there is any damage done so you always want to be adding lime to your top coat it's just good practice and as you can see the mix is is quite you know it's not too thick we can work with it so you never want to render too thick it's just a it's, it makes it quite tough to stick to the wall and not only that it's just hard on your body so that's a quick rundown on the mix for the top coat but like i said check out the end of this video and i'll give you a full guide on mixing render so let's crack on with the rest of the process okay so the next two clips i went to film about me applying the second coat of render and i'm useless for technology <laughs> I messed up my GoPro and I missed two of the main footages. So what I'm going to do is revert back to all the clips that I've done, some old rendering videos on your previous channel. I'm going to walk you through exactly how to apply your second coat of render. It's the exact same, but I'm going to go into it logistically on, on why we're doing each section. So follow the next clip just to find out what that's about. Okay, so I'm going to talk you through the process. Like I said, you've roughly seen, we're putting it, we're putting the render into the wall and we're just really pushing into the scratch. And that, that application of water I've given has made it such a difference. You can see from ruler wall, you can pull it off and it's not fighting us. It's still got a lot of moisture in there. When you're ruling, it's easier and it's not pulling. And that was definitely the biggest mistake I made in the last video, was just not priming, priming the walls ready for the, for the top coat. And the mix is nice and creamy. You don't want your mix to be too thick because you'll just struggle to spread it and it won't grip properly. You want a bit of moisture there. And then when you're putting it into the scratch, it's got something to bind with. Give it a quick flatten, nothing crazy. Now what I like to do is put the render Thicker, slightly thicker than what we've already ruled, and that way we've got something to pull. You don't want it to be too shallow because you're forever ruling off, putting back on again. And it's a pain. You want to put a section on. So that was me applying the second coat. What I'm going to show you now is how to rule the render. Like I mentioned before, 
This is the process of getting a render flat. You never do it with your trowel. And as I've mentioned in this video, you don't want to be playing with your render too much because you will make, you'll compromise it basically. So I'm going to show you what your tools to use to make sure you're going to get that wall dead flat. So what I'm going to do is talk over this clip. It was very windy when I filmed this, so um, ignore what I'm saying in the video. Basically what I'm holding here is a feather edge. This is the rule I was talking about, and this is how we're going to start getting the render flat. What you do is you actually scrape the, the high spots of the render, and what we're doing is we're ruling it flat. We're using this as a guide. So rather than using a trowel, you'd never get the render flat with a trowel. We're using this tool to ensure that every area of the wall is flat. So first of all, I'm ruling horizontally. This is my usual go-to. I always start horizontally. Uh, it's just easier to start with, basically. I find it easier on the body, and it's easier to find a guide. But what you're doing is you're literally you're pulling any high spots of render. Um, like I said, this is why I always try and apply the render a bit thicker, the second coat, because it means we've got something to work with. So as you can see, this is dark art to this. It looks quite easy, but it's actually quite tough. Ruling render is, is there's quite a skill to it. So it does take practice, which is why I recommend you practice with the scratch coat first. Um, and again, this is called a feather edge. And the point is that it just makes it a bit easier to collect the render and scoop it back in the uh, tub when you're done with it. So what we're doing is we're always working vertically as well as horizontally. And that means and ensures that the wall is flat both ways. You never just rule one way because it, it it just it never comes out right and it won't be completely flat all the way around. So like I said, you rule off, you scrape off any render and you always have a clean rule to start with and to end with. So now what you do, if you have any low spots of render, which you will have, you fill any low spots um, and then what you do is you rule them again. So what you find when you do rule the wall, you'll find some areas have not been ruled which means there's low areas so what you do is you get the render fill any spots that are low and then you rule it flat again and this is what you want this is what you're looking for for your wall to be completely flat and there's no gaps or holes or rivets between the rule and the render that is the ideal situation that's what we're aiming for when we're ruling a wall now we're going to move on to the next stage which is floating which i'll talk about and that's where we continue to get the wall flatter and flatter that's what it looks like when it's ruled, ready for the next stage. So now we come into the final stages of rendering. This is where we get the wall flat, smooth and crisp. So the stage I'm going to show you now, this is called floating. I've got a diamond float, this is a Rafina float, but you can just use a plastic or wooden float. It doesn't matter what you use, um, the process is always the same. What we're doing is pulling any areas that are high, any high spots from the render and filling any areas that are low. So let me walk you through that now. Right, we're coming to a very crucial stage of rendering here. Uh, this is called the floating. And basically what I'm holding is, it is actually called a float. And what it is, is basically a fat, flat piece of plastic. It can either be, it can be PU, it can be a wooden float, it doesn't matter which float you use, but the process is extremely, extremely important. So when you've ruled off the render, even though it is flat, it's never completely flat and there's going to be a few rivets and a few areas that are either low or high. And what this does, it does one of two things, it, it scrapes any areas of high, any high spots of render, it pulls them off, and whilst it's pulling the areas that are high, it also fills in any low areas. Um, you're going to have a close up and I'm going to show you in detail how it works, but basically if there's any low spots, so if there's any areas that look rough in the render where basically it's been pulled, um, what this does is it fills in them areas and what we're doing is starting to get that render smooth. Once you've done the ruling, the ruling process can leave the render very rough, serrated um, and it leaves it in a bit of a, a hard way. So what we're doing here, we're starting to fill in any areas that got affected during the ruling process. And what you do is you collect any any fat that you collected from the render when you rule float him, you pull it into the low spots. So as you could see then I had a low spot of render on area that got affected when the ruled. Um, and I took a bit of excess render and I put it in that hole. And what you do is you work in circular motions and it compresses the render. It pushes the render into itself. And it not only makes it flatter, but it also makes it stronger. So look, you can collect it. I always keep a bit of render in a bucket. As you can see there was a few low spots there. Just apply the render to the low spot. And then what you do is you always hold the 
float flat to the wall, it needs to be flat, so you push the float flat and then you're working in circular motion, you start to fill in them low areas. Can you see how where there was a gap before? Now it's filling in nicely. That's because we're using the render and we're compressing it into itself. So the, at the end of this, it won't not only be flat, but there won't be any holes, there won't be any low areas. And what we do is we always work towards the bead. So what I do is float clockwise towards the bead and then run up the bead as well. So by the end of this, we'll not only have a flat wall, but we'll be in a wall that won't have any holes or hollows or any rivets. Okay, and now the final stage to rendering. Bear with us, you're at the, probably the easiest part now. This is probably the easiest stage to rendering. This is called sponging. All we're doing is giving it that crisp finish now. And what I've just got is a standard standard, um, standard sponge that you use to clean a car with. They're called jumbo sponges here in the UK. And I'm gonna show you the exact process and how to start getting that wall looking perfect. So like I said in this clip, this is probably the easiest stage to rendering. Rendering is not an easy game, by the way. We've took a lot in so far. Um, but basically what we're doing after the floating process, the final stage is just to give it that, uh, just give it that crisp finish that you really like in sand cement. And all you do is you get a sponge, and the first rule is don't keep your sponge wet. So you clean it out, and you, dr you real punch, and you clench the water out of it so you really want a dry damp sponge you don't want a soaking wet sponge because what it'll do is liven up the render and it'll make it it'll bring it back so what you want is to is to keep it damp whatever don't be scared by the way if you see any low spots before the sponge don't try and get it with a sponge get the float back out fill in any areas that need filling and make sure you float it flat you will not get it with a sponge when the sun comes out you'll see any damaged areas so again straight after the float you get your damp sponge and you work in little circular motions keeping a real light grip on the sponge you don't want to push it hard into the render it's a real soft grip and what it does is it brings the aggregate from the sand and it brings it to the surface and what this gives you is that nice nice little textured surface in the render um, but like I said it's real soft grip and what you you will find is uh, the render will collect on the sponge and when it does just put it in the water clean it off wring the water off the sponge again and then start again but you never want the render to collect on the underside of the sponge because what it'll do is it'll start pulling lines and the lines will start to show in the top coat so you always want a clean sponge when you're doing this you'll um, probably see me in the clip going back to a bucket I've just got a bucket of fresh water next to me and what you want to do is just keep the sponge clean that's the biggest rule I can tell you about sponging and the final stage of render just keep the sponge clean. So like I said, we're just working in small circular motions. Um, we're just basically just giving it that final, final finish. And look, sm small circles, nothing big. And again, running up the bead, you really want to clo clo pay close attention to um, angles because that's probably the most important stage. Um, and probably one of the most important areas is to make sure that your angles are always crisp. So as you see, there was the underside of the sponge is getting dirty there. I've turned it around, I've used a clean side. But once you see that, where the render is collecting, just put it in the bucket, clean it off, and then start again. Like I said, it's not a wet. I'm not getting any moisture onto the render. I've wrung the water straight out of the sponge. You don't want a wet sponge. And then if you follow the rules applied in the video, you'll get a banging finish. So that's the full process. As you can see, that's the finished wall. It's a lot better than what it was. And that's it. That's the full process on how to render a wall. Like I said, if you click, there should be something floating above here. That's the video that's going to lead you to the perfect mix and rendering. Like I said, it's a total different process, um, a total different subject to itself. So make sure you click that. But before you do that, please like and subscribe to our video and our channel if you enjoyed what you've seen today. I'd really appreciate it if you just kind of tagged along and watched us on our journey. And feel free to leave a comment We'd love to hear from you. Let us know what you think. And uh, yeah, thank you so much for watching. I really appreciate it. And uh, make sure you check us out and keep following. So thanks a lot. I'll see you in the next one. Cheers.